Police Battalion 101. From North Germany, middle-aged reserve conscripts uh, at, the, at this stage of the war. Sergeant Hein, the man in charge, uh, of course, meets with his local counterpart, Serafimovich, uh, and who's translating, but the 17-year-old Jewish Oswald Hufeisen passing as uh, the half-Pole, half-German. And Sergeant Hein says, well, I need a translator. You, you can sleep at night in Serafimovich's house, but you'll come and work at my police station during the day. So for eight months, Oswald Rufeisen sleeps in the house of the Belarusian police captain and during the day sits at the right-hand side of Sergeant Hein conducting all of his business with uh, the uh, local population. Now, he told his story to others, but I also, uh, we were both witnesses at the Simon Serafimovich trial in, in England when Serafimovich was, was fled there, finally uncovered. Uh, and we were sequestered as two witnesses in a country hotel in, uh, outside of London. So we spent a weekend talking about all of this. Uh, and uh, that uh, several few minutes, uh, you know, uh, Rufeisen then went on to explain what happened after that. Uh, Rufeisen uh, was basically, no one, no one knew that he was Jewish, including the local Jews. And when he tried to warn the local ghetto that they were about to be liquidated, Someone in the ghetto, thinking he was a provo provocateur, informed on him to Sergeant Hahn and said, your translator has told us this wild story that we're all going to be killed. Sergeant Hahn, very upset, brings in Rufeisen and said, why did you betray me? And Rufeisen said, well, you have to understand, sir, I didn't betray you, I'm a Jew. And Hahn says, oh, that's a problem. Let me think about that. You stay here. And he walks out of the office. The back door is, window is open. And he lets Ruvizen escape. Ruvizen fled and survived the war. Uh, so we have now the testimony of Ruvizen about the dynamics of the 13 German policemen in this village with absolutely no motive to hide or be exculpatory about policemen. And so the question is then, in a sense, uh, what, what, what's the upshot? What does Ruvizen tell us uh, about this police unit? First is they divide it into three groups. Four of them were the eager killers uh, they, uh, that uh, wanted to go out in killing actions, volunteered for killing actions, and enjoyed the killing actions. Uh, there was a middle group uh, and of whom uh, basically he said they were the passive uh, executors of orders. Uh, and he writes, uh, he says as follows, it was clear that there were differences in their outlooks. I think that the whole business of Jewish extermination they considered unclean. The operations against the partisans were not in the same category. For them, a confrontation with partisans was a battle, a military move. But a move against Jews was something they might have experienced as dirty. And then he went on to the evaders, and he says, four of them that did not participate in any Jewish action, and he says, quote, no one seemed to bother them, no one talked about their absences, it was as if they had the right to abstain. So from a completely different source, from a completely different angle, we have Rufeisen describing exactly the same division and exactly the same dynamic that I had read out of the police testimonies that Golden had said I had been duped on, and I said I thought right, I read rightly, and I think he read wrongly. So I continue to claim that I'm right and he is wrong. Uh, there's one other uh, uh, way in which we can look at this, and this is to try to do a comparative genocide comparison. Uh, this is very difficult because in the case of the Holocaust, one reason why we have so much research of the Holocaust is that's the war we won and we have the records, we can put the perpetrators on trial. We know so much more about the Holocaust than we do about any other genocide. Uh, there is one case, however, where we have been able to do not as much, but something that makes it possible uh, to compare uh, genocidaire, uh, genocide killers with uh, the killers of the Holocaust. And this is Rwanda. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate to have been at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as a visiting scholar in 2002-2003, when a psychiatrist from Rwanda was also there uh, as a visitor. Uh, and uh, he has the almost impossible name of Athanasa Hagen Gimano, which I don't expect anyone to remember. 
but in any case, uh, he uh, talked to us about his experiences. And one thing that made him unique was he came of mixed parents. He was half Hutu, half Tutsi. In his family, he had one sister who had been murdered as a Tutsi. He had one sister who was under arrest as a Hutu genocidaire. So his family was split completely down the middle. Uh, he isn't a partisan on either side. After, in the aftermath of the genocide, his first reaction was to go to the displaced persons camps uh, over the border, <coughs> excuse me, uh, over the border in Rwanda, uh, not Rwanda, in Uganda, uh, and uh, to basically try to deal with the trauma of the survivors. But also alongside the uh, refugee camps were also prisons that were filled with arrested Hutus who had also fled, had been captured, and were imprisoned awaiting trial. And so he decided that his, his specialty as a psychiatrist, it was incumbent upon him uh, to go into the prisons and to try to find out what he could uh, from uh, the, the Hutu genocide there that were held there. He got permission to do that, and so he, sent, he submitted to them a first research instrument that basically was a, a request to self-report the degree of involvement in killing. Ask various questions to establish how much you had been involved in the killing. How much of a killer were you? Now, obviously some people lied and, and didn't tell the full truth, but he got a remarkable number of people who actually were self-confessed, hardcore, full-time killers. To that group, he then submitted a second questionnaire in which he tried to think of every possible motive and what questions would reveal that motive uh, if these people again continue to answer the questionnaires honestly. And when the questionnaires came back, uh, he said it was unlike any result he had ever had in any research instrument he had ever devised, that almost every question had no correlation, it was a flat line, but there were two clusters of questions that simply shot off uh, the baseline uh, peaked uh, in, in, to an extraordinary degree. The first cluster of questions that shot off the baseline uh, were ones that basically dealt with how they perceived their victims. And here we come to the ideological framing and above all to the capacity of the killers to have dehumanized their victims. To describe what they had done as killing cockroaches, as killing vermin, not as committing murder against other human beings. That if people will ideologically frame what they're doing as sanitation, uh, not murder, uh, it makes the task infinitely easier. And that one characteristic of these units is they had persuaded themselves, in fact, they were not murdering fellow human beings, but engaged in, uh, a, uh, in, in, a, in a process of, of, of sanitation, of cleaning up society from uh, yeah, pest control, one might say. The second cluster of questions dealt with how they were viewed in the eyes of their comrades. Issues of esteem. Did their comrades, they wanted, you know, they did what they did because they wanted their comrades to hold them in high esteem, to consider them as tough, to consider them as people who did their share and more, who always went the extra length uh, to carry out their duties uh, to be gung-ho uh, about what the unit was doing, uh, to always exceed what was uh, required, uh, and uh, that uh, to be held in high regard by your comrades. So it was in the, this is the question that deal with the dynamic of the group. Are you valued in your group? Are you valued by your comrades? And this was the other cluster of questions that helped to how they, in their answers, revealed what it was that drove them to do what they did. So here we get, I think, back to Newman, the fact that you need both a ideological part and a situational part. Uh, the two go together, and when they're blended together, you get a very toxic mixture. But both the ideological framing that dehumanizes the victim and the urge to be seen and held in esteem by those around you, to be a star in your unit, uh, even if it means a killing unit, by which case you have to be a super killer. Uh, these, uh, I think, both came together 
I think, in uh, German killing units and comparatively uh, in the killing units of the Rwandan genocide. Uh, with that, I think I will stop and, and welcome uh, questions that you might have. Thank you. Bueno, pues abrimos la sesión para preguntas. Eh, if you frame it, si lo dicen en español, I'll translate. Y si se sienten cómodos en inglés, adelante. ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? Carlos, ¿quién es el ¿No tienen preguntas? Sí, voy para. ¿Hay alguna manera que podemos prevenir que esto vuelva a pasar de nuevo en la historia de los judíos? It's impossible, it's almost unbelievable to, to think what happened in, in those years, but we are still uh, answering ourselves. How was that possible to, to, to happen? Yeah. I, I think we, we need a somewhat broader framework. When we say never again, I think we have to mean not never again will Hitler put Jews into gas chambers, that never again should any dictator mobilize people to carry out the genocide of another group. And the question there is obviously we fail. It hasn't been never again. One can go from uh, Rwanda to Cambodia uh, to Bosnia uh, and to uh, the Belgian Congo uh, to sites where all sorts of terrible things continue to happen. The first steps in how do we prevent that? One is, I think, to realize that genocides, uh, in part, can be caused because for the, for the dictator planning genocide, if a regime wants to commit genocide, one problem they will not have is a shortage of executioners. That is not the bottleneck. If you want to commit genocide, you can harness and organize and mobilize people to carry out the killing. Uh, so, uh, the first line of defense is to preserve democracies that value human rights and prevent dictators that might have the predilection to carry out genocide from coming to power. So, preserving the political culture of democracies is our very first line of defense. I think the second then is in the cases where we don't have that, is to see the warning signals uh, when people begin to be dehumanized when groups begin to be scapegoated and isolated and become uh, blamed for all the ills of society, or even more being blamed as a mortal threat. Most modern genocides have been carried out under the claim of self-defense. The genocidaire themselves act as if, or frame this, that if we don't kill them, they're going to kill us. If Hitler doesn't kill the Jews, the world Jewish conspiracy is going to destroy Germany. Uh, so those are, those are the and said so when we see ethnic relations or relations between groups being shaped and described in that way, that is a serious warning signal that we've got to understand something potentially can happen. Doesn't mean that it will, but we have to know that this is a, a possibility on the horizon if an entire society can accept that they are mortally threatened by someone else and that. Their problems will be solved if that other group disappears. Uh, so, uh, th we have no silver bullet. Uh, we know that international cooperation is tremendously difficult to get. <coughs> Almost any genocide is carried out because a group uh, is isolated and other groups aren't disadvantaging themselves for the sake of, of that targeted group. Uh, so, uh, it, we, we have no guarantee, we have no silver bullet. But awareness and defense of democratic political culture is, I think, the first, first and best lines of defense that we have. Thank you. Hi, I'm 
Valeria, and I'm studying international relations. And my question for you is that uh, um, that we are watching like all these racist movements. So how do we deal with this uh, increasing ideology? Like for example, here in Mexico, that we are like trying to push away some of uh, our friends in Salvador or other countries. So how we can deal or prevent these types of of violence or or ideologies ideologies to or how like yeah how do we deal with this increasing ideology here like in, in the case of Mexico? Yeah, I mean I think the, I think the the first step is is to understand that most ideologies are in fact trying to divide us into in-groups and out-groups, people with whom we identify and with whom we grant moral obligation and people outside that that are an enemy and whom are threaten us and to whom we deny any moral obligation. Helen Fine had the, the, the extraordinary phrase, uh, expelling someone from the community of human obligation. And that, in a sense, set them up as a potential victim of genocide. Uh, so the whole notion of human rights is a universalistic notion. People have rights because they are human beings, not because they are Republicans or because they are Americans or because they are Mexicans or because they are Germans. Uh, they have rights because they are human beings. Uh, and that you have to, in a sense, preserve the universalism of that notion as the best way to combat an ideology that wants to divide us rather than recognize the commonalities between us. Uh, so it is, a, that is an ideological argument. You're going to be, if, you're, if you're arguing with these people, you're arguing on behalf of a notion of humanity and the notion of human rights uh, that is incompatible with an ideology that privileges certain groups, claims superiority for certain groups, and blames all the problems on other groups. Te prendo el micrófono, pero todo se oye medio ruido. Creo que es Now, there was an honor to hear your like, very explicit conversation about all this organization, all the machinery. There's a current topic in Mexico today which refers to the National Guard. You, I think you mentioned that within the organization of, of uh, the German machinery, there was like a fourth group of National Guards. Reserve police are, are, are like that. Reserve police. They all come from a particular region, much like an American National Guard in the U.S. Uh, you have National Guard units that are locally based uh, because you, they're not usually they're not full time, so they're training together on weekends or. I can understand what you're saying. Yeah. Do they have any special duties? Uh, well, that depends. I mean, the the Amer I said the U.S. National Guard can be called up in emergencies. No, in the case of Germany. In the case oh, Germany. of Germany. Uh, the, well, the the. Before the war, they were being held uh, as, a, as, a, as a kind of, exactly, as a reserve. No, they didn't have special duties. Once the war started, then they were brought together into these 500-man police battalions and sent out to do police work in the occupied territories. Now, in 3940, when they're occupying Poland and Netherlands, Norway, uh, you know, Holland and France, uh, they're not killing out mass killings yet. Uh, but what they're doing, say, in Poland is picking up weapons that the Polish army threw away, uh, that they're uh, doing police work. They also happen to be guarding the witch ghetto. So they're beginning to get into enforcing Jewish policy as well. Uh, but it will only be in 41 that they become, in a sense, full-fledged killing units. That, so that's not part of their initial duties. It becomes a duty uh, in the course of the war. Well, the reason I mention is that right now in Mexico there's a very controversial topic about an, a National Guard that's being formed. And this is a combination of uh, military and police within a special force. And some people are saying, you know, we're, we're going to have a military force in the streets. To what extent is there any limit of what they can be doing or not doing? So this is the reason I, I took it as a question. Thank you very much. Okay.
Hi, my name is Yana. I'm a student from JL and I want to ask why if genocide crime is happening or happens in many countries, the people insist to deny this crime just like Holocaust and what we can do to prevent that? I'm afraid I didn't catch all of the question. Oh. The, uh, I mean, why if genocide oh, crime is oh. happening in many countries or happens before, and many people insist to deny this crime, just like the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly, I'll go back, let's start with definition. Uh, after World War II, a man named Raphael Lemkin uh, argued very vehemently before the UN that we needed a, a international law to deal with what he considered uh, not a new crime, but one that had become so prominent it had to be defined <coughs> and enshrined in international law. Uh, and this is where the Genocide Convention described genocide is the intended destruction in whole or in part of an ethnic, national, or religious group. Uh, and so intention became very key and particular categories, ethnic, religious, uh, racial, uh, were, in, were included. But because this had to pass the UN, political groups weren't covered. Uh, so, uh, and, and social groups weren't. Certainly the Soviet Union, having boasted they had wiped out the kulaks, uh, is not going to have the destruction of a social class defined as genocide, because they would basically ex post facto being criminalizing one of their own policies. So it was a very imperfect definition. It was a definition that came out of a compromised political process.